We are uh, we're looking at Second Samuel chapter 19, the tail end of chapter 19, and all of chapter 20 this week. It's a little bit of a bigger text, and I'm going to be honest. Sometimes, like we don't, I don't. Better pastors probably do, and make it look really, really seamless. I don't sit down when I'm planning to preach through a book or something like that and go, okay, on week 13, it's going to be this Sunday and this is going to be happening and, and I want to make sure I'm in this part of the text. I mean, it's very difficult for me to do that. I just I just break it down. So this, we're in um, a pretty brutal chapter. If you've been paying attention to us at all or you know anything about the Old Testament and the history, like we're in the kind of the... Uh, David, Kingdom of David in Israel, you know, um, this is not, uh, it's not children's literature, and it's its written um, with a, a, it's just reporting what happened, and it's not all good. And so, um, I'm going to try to be discreet, but all that said, if I could plan it again, we would be in this passage in a couple of weeks when the kids are downstairs talking about a different version of this story, Okay. But as you read along, you'll see it. I'll try not to scare anybody. But what I, I need is to see something here, because this isn't the only part of the Bible like this. Um, there's a lot to struggle with here. This, is, uh, this section is, it is descriptive of what happened. It is not prescriptive of what ought to have happened or what, what one ought to do if they find themselves in similar situations. That might, be, that might be shocking for some folks. Sometimes it's easy to approach the Bible with this simplistic idea that if I read it in the Bible, it's good and I can go and do likewise, right? So you flip it, but the thing is the Bible is full of stories of people and many times they're doing absolutely the wrong thing. And sometimes that's the point. It, it's recorded as an example for us. But just because, it's like, well, it's in the Bible, it's like, yeah, but was it like a do this or don't do this part of the Bible? So we'll see. Um, but I want us to also see that in the midst of kind of the gritty uh, realism of this struggle for the kingdom, there are some very important principles that we can pick up, even though our circumstances are very different. I think we can pick these things up, especially if we keep the, if we keep the nature of our own sin in view the pervasive and rebellious nature of our own sin. Now, I know, we don't, we don't like to talk about sin. We don't even like to think about sin. And, and our culture that we live in today, I mean, it tells us that the very concept of sin is somehow incorrect, right? The idea of something being objectively wrong for all people in all places is, it's like an outdated, flawed way of thinking. But the Bible tells a different story. The Bible um, operates on the assumption that God exists and that God, because he exists and he's, he's God above everything and everything that exists was created by him and for him, that he determines and has determined what is good and then anything that doesn't line up with that is therefore not good, it's bad, and if it, we're talking about human actions, they're sinful. The Bible teaches that we as people um, were created by God, by Him, and in His image, and for His glory, and so we are morally bound to submit to His rule. Again, He says, this is good, so we have not just a functional obligation, like a fish has a functional obligation to breathe in water. If it rebels against that and goes, forget that, you can't tell me where to breathe, and it flips up on the dock, it will die, right? Um, but we have, we have a long-term functional obligation, but we have a moral obligation to do what is good, um, to submit to his rule. And the Bible teaches that actually that's, that brings us joy to do so because it is intrinsic with how we are created, the same way that breathing water brings joy to a fish. Um, the Bible also teaches us that when we use our free will, it's part of the image of God in us, and we choose instead of choosing to follow God, we choose to reject God's rule, that we are not just individuals expressing our own truth, but that we are treasonous rebels who have actually broken a real law against a, an actual moral authority that had, that had the moral right to impose that law on us. We are wrong, we are sinful if we rebel against God. And that's what the Bible teaches. And so, um, and furthermore, the Bible teaches, and I think our own experience shows, that our own hearts 
are, are twisted by sin so that we are drawn to it and we love it. To go back to the fish example, right? If you've ever caught a fish and you pull it out of the water, it's not like, oh, awesome, I've been so waiting to get in a boat. Sweet, right? It is like doing everything it can to get back in the water. It has, it is not drawn to the land, unless you're talking about one of those funny little fishes, those that crawl out, those mud skipper things. That's weird. That's a different story. Um, but we, we're twisted so that we are actually drawn to doing the wrong thing. Even though we know it's wrong, even though we hate it when someone does that to us, it has a draw to us. It's like a magnetic pull. We can deny it, but we're lying. And so we recognize that we've got this draw to it, even though it kills us and the people around us. And so as we look at this violent chapter in the life of David's kingdom, I want us to, to, to pay attention to what's going on in the story, but also think about the rebels in our own hearts and how we might deal with them. Okay, so for a bit of context, if you're just joining us, um, David has been the king of Israel, but he's come through a really rough stretch here. His um, eldest son at the time decided that he wanted to be king, Absalom. He raised up kind of a rebellion against David, declared himself king, and David had to flee the country. Um, Absalom's forces pursued him. There was, a, there was a war sort of to determine who was going to be the king, and Absalom was killed, which was sad for King David, but also good for his kingdom. So he's been, um, you know, making his way back, sort of bridging that, okay, where do we go from here? Kingdom who has kind of sided with my son and rejected me, but now... My son's gone, so you're wondering if this is going to be a good fit or not. And we saw last week how um, some of those gaps were getting bridged and David was being invited back. So um, he was brought across the river and they're bringing him up to Jerusalem. We jump in in 2 Samuel 19, verse 41, this first section I'm going to read to, uh, to chapter 20, verse 2. It says, Then all the men of Israel came to the king and said, Why have our brothers, the men of Judah, stolen you away and brought the king and his household over the Jordan and all David's men with him. All the men of Judah answered the men of Israel, um, because the king is our close relative. Why then are you angry over this matter? Have we eaten at all of the, at the king's expense? Has he given us any gifts? The men of Israel answered the men of Judah, we have ten shares in the king, and in David also we have more shares than you. Why then did you despise us? Were we not the first to speak of bringing back our king? But the words of the men of Judah were more fierce, were fiercer than the, men, the words of the men of Israel. Now, there happened to be a worthless man whose name was Sheba, the son of Bichri, a Benjamite. And he blew the trumpet and said, We have no portion in David, and we have no inheritance in the son of Jesse. Every man to his tents, O Israel. So all the men of Israel withdrew from David and followed Sheba, the son of Bichri. But the men of Judah followed their king steadfastly from the Jordan to Jerusalem. So you would be pardoned at this point to be like, what, again? Like, didn't we just deal with this, right? We just got done putting down one rebellion. We come back, and here's this issue. Um, I think the, the question that pops up to me, why? Why did Sheba rebel? What was the deal with this? Why were people so upset? I think there's several cultural things going on here that I don't want to do the huge deep dive into. But it's some things we can relate to. It seems like they're maybe getting really upset over kind of a petty thing. Like, you got to walk across the river with the king and I wasn't invited. You went first and I did. Why didn't you call us? Why didn't... Right? There's, there's a lot of the, the honor and the perceived honor of the formality to this process. I think there's also underlying tensions between the, the tribes in the north, which are referred to as the kingdom of Israel, and then the tribe of Judah, which is more in the south, and that's, that's the tribe David's from. So there's some, some of those tensions never really go away. Something like this just brings them to the surface. And I think there's also probably some unresolved frustrations all the way around with David's reign. Remember, David has been king for years at this point, and when Absalom, his son, wanted to seize the throne, he didn't do it by challenging his dad to an arm wrestling match. He spent years basically campaigning subtly 
and reminding people of the ways David had dropped the ball and disappointed them and sowing discontent. So by the time Absalom said, that's it, it's time for, for change, I'm going to be king, it says he had stolen the hearts of the men of Israel. They were like, yeah, you know what, we don't want David to be king, we want Absalom. And just because Absalom was killed in battle doesn't mean suddenly David's their view of David, the frustrations with things that David has done and the way he has done it suddenly goes away. This was a fragile situation already and it seems like um, this, this little matter of feeling slighted by, oh, you know, like the men of Judah came down, he, they got like an invitation and they didn't bring us and so that has insulted us because they didn't wait and all that. That was, that was the little trigger incident to blow this whole thing up. Interestingly, though, right, David seems to have forgiven the men of Judah and the men of Israel for siding against him with Absalom. We saw last week when he was, you know, he's over on the other side of the Jordan, he's defeated Absalom's army. He doesn't say, okay, that's it, I'm going to come back and I am going to gather up all the people who turned against me and I'm going to punish them. They're going to see what's what. He was, he was extending an olive branch, as it were, right? He was offering pardon to the people who had wronged him. David is, is extending grace to come over. And the men of Israel seemed like they wanted to bring the king back. They wanted, and this is where the parallels to us start to show up, they wanted to resubmit to the rule of the Lord's anointed king. But they wanted it on their own terms. Right? They wanted to have equal glory and prestige and honor with the men of Judah. They didn't want to be second. That pride where it's like, I will, I will submit to the Lord's anointed, but not if it causes me to have to be humbled at all. I want to maintain my dignity. And I wonder sometimes if we do the same thing. We... We hear the gospel, and we might even want to and say that we have and act in a way that we, we say we're submitting to the rule of the Lord's anointed, but do we do that because he is the rightful king? And I'm talking Jesus now, the son of David. Or do we do it because, yeah, like do we do it because we see him as the rightful king, or do we do it because we think we are his rightful subjects? We somehow deserve that relationship. Like the men of Judah and Israel in this case, do we too forget that we are rebels? That the king coming in peace is because he is extending us pardon. He would be very justified in coming in anger and wrath and justice. David came in peace. The northern tribes seemed to forget that they were rebels. And so they, uh, they got offended at him and rejected him. I wonder if we sometimes do the same thing. This next section we see, it's a short one. I want us to see David's response. So we saw Sheba's rebellion. This is David's response in, in uh, 20 verses 3 to 7. It said, And David came to his house at Jerusalem. Um, the king took the ten concubines whom he had left to care for the house, and he put them in a house under guard and provided for them. But he didn't go in with them. They were shut up until the day of their death, living as if in wil widowhood. And the king said to Amasa, Call the men of Judah together to me within three days, and be here yourself. So Amasa went to summon Judah, but he delayed beyond the set time that had been appointed for him. And David said to Abishai, Now Sheba the son of victory, that guy who rebelled, he will do, more, do us more harm than Absalom. Take your Lord's servants and pursue him, lest he get himself to fortified cities and escape from us. And there went out after him Joab's men, and the, uh, the Carathites and the Pelathites, and all the mighty men. They went out from Jerusalem to pursue Sheba, the son of Bichri. So David, when he gets back to Jerusalem, he does a couple of things. I don't want to camp on it, but first we see that he, um, he dealt with these concubines that were left, and they were there when Absalom was there, and he's basically put them under house arrest, and there's a bit of a break with the old kingdom. Um, but we see that David's response to this Sheba situation is significant. First, he calls Amasa. So for those who are like these names, I'm forgetting. Amasa is actually a relative of David, but he's the one that his rebellious son Absalom made the commander. He made him the general because when David fled Jerusalem, Joab, who was the commander of the military, came with him. Um, 
Um, Absalom, as he's wanting to take over the kingdom, he needs a general. So he grabs this guy, Amasa, and makes him the general. When David, after Absalom was defeated and David was looking to come back, we saw last week, David specifically communicated to Amasa, sort of saying, listen, I'm not, I'm not going to come and kill you. You're, you're a relative of mine. In fact, I will let you keep your job. Under my new kingdom, you will continue to be the commander instead of Joab. Now, partly, David was mad at Joab, so it's a bit of a demotion. But Amasa has this job just because David was gracious to him. So he says, Amasa, hey, general, I need you to gather up the men of Judah and get back here in three days. This is like a military, it's it muster the troops because we have work to do. And be here yourself, he says. But Amasa was slow to do it. And David, instead of waiting, he expresses his view of this whole Sheba situation. This is not a small thing. It's not like, well, hey, he's run away. We don't know where he is. I'm here in the kingdom. I'm here in Jerusalem. It's all good. He, he tells Abishai, so that's Joab's brother. He was also a military commander. But interestingly, he talked to Amasa. Then he talked to Abishai. Joab's not on the list. Joab is in David's bad books right now. He says, listen, we're not going to wait for this guy. I need you to take whatever soldiers we have and go after this guy, Sheba. So Absalom went, or not Absalom, sorry, Abishai went out with uh, the soldiers that were there. Interestingly, described as Joab's men, right? These are men who had been serving under Joab for years and years and years. They're following Joab's brother, and he sends them out. David saw this rebellion as a greater threat than Absalom's attempted coup, which is interesting. Because Absalom seemed to be scarier. Why, why does David see this as different? I think part of it is because what Sheba was doing didn't merely threaten David's position as king. It threatened the kingdom itself. Sheba wasn't proposing that he should be king in David's place, right? We had David, no, get rid of David. Absalom, Absalom said, how about me? Anyone but David, right? That's not what he's saying. He, Sheba was rejecting the idea of the north and the south being part of the same kingdom. His rebellion was threatening the whole thing that God had put in place. So David saw this very seriously. Interestingly, David had basically ignored or tolerated, turned a blind eye to, um, his son Absalom's subversive activity for years. David's not a dummy. He would have heard what's going on. Ah, it's not that bad. Give him enough rope, he'll hang himself. Kind of just give him a chance, right? David was kind of soft on his kids. David ignored that activity for years, and it nearly cost David his throne. It did cost the lives of some 20,000 soldiers in battle and the king's son. David responds differently this time. He doesn't wait. He acts quickly, losing no time in gathering his forces and sending them out in pursuit of Sheba. He sees this. It looks small now, but I can see where this is going. It's going to be trouble. I think this is a good example for us as well, just coming back to that idea of, of the sin in our hearts, the sinful habits that have maybe got a hold of us, but we're like, you know what, it's not that bad, I've got it. No one's perfect, right? Ah, it's my little thing. And we can be tolerant of it, or we can see it as a threat. How do we deal with sin in our hearts as Christians, especially sin that starts small? Listen, ignoring it does not mean that it will go away. It merely allows it to gather strength. Um, a Puritan author, he lived years and years and years ago, long dead, named John Owen, is famously, uh, one of his more well-known quotes, he says, we need to be killing sin, or sin will be killing you. Like, that's what we got to do. Tolerating it is just letting it find more ammo. David does not make that mistake twice. Now we get to the middle section, where we hear of Joab's revenge, and this is... This is not a fun part of the story, but we see what's going on. Okay, so um, Abishai has led the troops out. It says, when they were at the great stone that is in Gibeon, Amasa came to greet them. So Amasa, just pause here. He was the one that was sent out, right? He had homework. Go and gather up specifically the troops in Judah and get back here. He was late. He had like three days. We don't know how long he's been. Oh, they bumped into him out here. Now, Joab was wearing a soldier's garment, and over it was a belt with a sword in its sheath, fastened on his thigh. And as he went forward, it fell out. 
And Joab said to Amasa, Is it well with you, my brother? And Joab took Amasa by the beard with his right hand to kiss him. But Amasa did not observe the sword that was in Joab's left hand. So Joab struck him with it in the stomach, spilled his entrails to the ground without striking a second blow, and he died. Then Joab and Abishai, his brother, pursued Sheba, the son of Bichri. And one of Joab's young men, or officers, took his stand by Amasa and said, Whoever favors Joab and whoever is for David, let him follow Joab. And Amasa lay wallowing in his blood in the highway. And anyone who came by, seeing him, stopped. And when the man saw that all the people stopped, he carried Amasa out of the highway into the field and threw a garment over him. When he was taken out of the highway, all the people went on after Joab to pursue Sheba, the son of Bichri. Okay, so let's pause there. This is just kind of a brutal section. If you've been following along in the story, you know this at all. You're not shocked at Joab's actions, but it's still kind of right in our face. Again, this is descriptive of what actually happened, not prescriptive of what one should do in these circumstances. If you get demoted and someone else gets your job, you're not to go up and offer to shake hands and then shank them with your left hand. That is not what the Bible's teaching. Don't do it, okay? If you take nothing else home, that and the bingo sheet, bring that to you. Um, but I want us to, to see a couple of things here. First, I want to, and I, I've got it in point form, so it'll go quick. I, I don't want to camp here a long time, but who was Amasa? What was the deal here? We don't know a ton about him directly, but I think there's, there's clues in the text. But there are different views on it. Was, was Amasa merely an innocent victim here? Was Amasa actually an embedded enemy in the kingdom? Or was Ma Amasa simply inept, like just not skilled at, uh, to do his job? I think there are, um, there's evidence in favor of all three. First, the idea that he's innocent. Um, in this incident, in this circumstances, Amasa was an innocent man. Okay, he was the commander of the armies of Judah. And so when Joab comes up to him, like he's Joab's boss at this point. Awkward as that may be, listen, you got to come up. It specifically mentions Joab was wearing a regular soldier's uniform, right? Not whatever the commander wore. He's wearing the regular fatigues, right? But he's, he's right there in the front of the line. And um, so Joab was, was under his authority. Amasa was killed not by an enemy combatant, but by one of his own men. And he wasn't killed in open battle. He was killed by, he was murdered by someone claiming to come in peace. That description of what Joab does, it sounds violent, right? He came to grab him by the beard and kiss him. If I was to do that to one of you with the beard, it'd be like, that would be an attack, right? Whoa, let go. Stop trying to kiss me, let go of my whiskers. This was a normal greeting, a, a, a come in peace kind of thing. So he was, I mean, it's the parallels to you can see the parallel with Jesus in the garden, right? Judas, one of his followers, comes and kisses him as a greeting of friendship, and he's actually setting him up to die. Um, Joab is just more efficient than Judas. Um, it describes what happened, and, I, and just to, to spell it out, like he was wearing a normal military uniform, he had an openly carried dagger or sword in a sheath, and it says when he was coming towards Amasa, it fell out. And what it, what it very much looks like is that, put it in Joab's mind, he sees Amasa, he seems to be alone or relatively alone, and Joab knows right away he wants to murder this guy. But when you are approaching your commanding officer, drawing your weapon is an unusual, inappropriate, and threatening gesture. But if he kind of trips and oh, his knife fell out, He's like, hey, Amasa, and he just kind of picks it up as one would do while approaching to, to stroke his beard. But instead of putting his knife back in, he, he put it in somewhere else. Um, and so it was, a, it was a contrived action to, to put Amasa off his guard and conceal the threat. He wasn't signaling aggression, but he could get a knife in his hand. So Amasa was, it was, uh, he, didn't, he didn't see it coming. He was the innocent victim here. And then lastly, I want to see that David, 
David later condemned Joab in his dying words to Solomon um, in 1 Kings chapter 2, verse 5. We'll get there in a few weeks. But um, David describes Joab's actions against Amasa and his earlier ones against another general that he murdered named Abner. David uh, describes those actions as uh, avenging in time of peace for blood that was shed in war. But even that seems to be giving Joab too much credit where Amasa is due because um, while Abner had killed Joab's brother in battle, we have no record that Amasa has ever hurt anyone close to Joab. This wasn't revenge. This was just ugly ambition and wounded pride. Joab, um, Joab didn't like that Amasa had his job and he was the target. But there's reason to suspect that Am Amasa might not have been all good. There may have been at least suspicion that he was, in fact, an embedded enemy. Um, first of all, think about what we know about Amasa. Amasa, even though he was related to David, was never part of David's administration. Joab, Abishai, all of these people we see when David, even when he was on the run from Saul and he's first kind of building his team and he takes power, he surrounds himself with people he knows and trusts, quite naturally, people in his family. Amasa is in that group. He's never invited. He's never trusted, apparently. Then we also know that when Absalom asked him, Amasa readily took up arms against David, the king didn't seem to need a lot of arm twisting, and he was in. We never, also, we never read of Amasa approaching David in repentance, confessing that he was wrong, seeking pardon for his rebellion. David granted Amasa his position as commander of the army um, as a gesture of reconciliation to him and also to all of the, the northern tribes. But we don't know how David felt towards Amasa as an individual. It's like we don't know if that ever got sorted out. David's instructions to Amasa curiously include an emphatically worded command for him to return personally with the men of Judah. That normally is the kind of thing that would be implied, but David kind of saying, I want you to go out and send them back, and I need you to come back. I want to know where you are and what you're doing. He wasn't trusted to operate independently. Then we see that Amasa's delay when he didn't show up on time um, that, may have, um, that may have been suspicious in David's eyes. And so he doesn't command Abishai, um, who was apparently second in command at that, that point, to go and get Amasa, but he does basically say, okay, you go and do the thing I told that other guy to do. I don't trust that he's going to do it. It's not like, I know he's late, but trust him. He has a good reason. Amasa has never let me down. He's going to come through. It's like, mm, yeah, you know what? You better go do it, Abishai. You and I have been through stuff. I know that you'll get it done. And then in stark contrast to the parallel murder of Abner, that other general earlier, there's no mention here of David mourning for Amasa. There's no mention of any immediate consequences for Joab. This may suggest that Amasa's death was not seen as the tragedy that Abner's was. Again, we don't want to you know, um, exegete from silence here, but there's some reasons to think it might not have all been great. Also, Amasa, Amasa just might not have been that good at his job. There's a good chance that Absalom selected him as commander, really as a figurehead, right? I need someone that's kind of in David's family for a bit of that legitimacy, someone who has some personal charisma that the people will trust, doesn't necessarily need someone with a military track record. And he, was, he might have been more of a figurehead. We don't actually read of Amasa doing anything right. Sorry to be brutal, but we don't. To quote uh, one of the commentators I read named Gunn, he says, there is something almost cruelly comic about the portrait. Amasa was a man whose loss of a key battle gained him a command, who failed to keep an appointment on his first day, and who could not spot the sword in his rival's hand. Maybe this it was bound to happen, right? Maybe natural selection was going to take this guy out. But however we judge Amasa, it's very clear that Joab acted dishonorably in killing him. While there might have been tactical merit in removing him, um, this murder was at least as personal as it was strategic, probably more so. Um, and then we see the unfortunate officer who's given the job, who's commanded to stand by the body, 
to keep the troops moving, right? That's awkward. And he's trying to spin it as, listen, if you are for David, follow Joab. Being loyal to David is the same as being loyal to Joab. Following Joab is what David's soldiers will do. You need to do that. But, but the people couldn't, couldn't easily get past the body in the road. Um, they didn't seem to have Joab's tolerance for cold-blooded murder. So a massive dying body was a distraction at best, and we know that, right? You drive by a car accident, everyone slows down, they got a gawk and rubberneck. But I think more than that, it was a vivid picture of who Joab is and how he tra treats the people that get in his way. And the question is, okay, so are you with them? Is that the guy you're following? Are you, are you one of his? I think it was an uncomfortable moment of reckoning for the soldiers. And so the officer eventually drags the body in off the main road and covers it up, right? Because it's a lot easier if they didn't have to think too clearly about the ethics of their uh, decision. I think we're the same way, aren't we? We don't like the idea of being manipulated, but at the same time, we desperately want to be distracted from the truth about, of who we are becoming as we conform to the pattern of this world. We, we don't want to think about it directly. And the world and the devil and our own sinful hearts are happy to oblige. Distraction, you got it. By the truckload, right? It's our specialty. God's word shows up and brings light and truth to us in those moments. And then we can see the brutal, ugly reality of our sin. It stops us in our tracks. And like those men following Joab, we have a choice. Do we admit that our sin is wrong? and that it is, it is ugly and that we refuse to pursue it? Or do we just drag it off into the tall grass, cover it up and carry on, justifying it as I'm doing my duty or I'm just trying to pursue unity or hey, everyone else is doing it, how long can it be? How do we respond when God brings light to our eyes and he shows us our sin for what it is? I don't know how many moments we get. Um, time's flying here, where are we at? Pedal fast, okay. Um, that's the main part, and then it slopes down from here. But there's this interesting um, next section where we um, meet a wise woman in chapter 20, verses 14 to 22. It says, And Sheba passed through all the tribes of Israel to Abel Beth Maka, and all the Bichrites, so he's Sheba, son of Bichri, these are people of his tribe, assembled and followed him in. And all the men who were with Joab came and besieged him in Abel of Beth Maka. So that's the name of the city. They cast up a mound against the city, and it stood against the rampart, and they were battering the wall to throw it down. Then a wise woman called from the city, Listen, listen, tell Joab, come here that I may speak to him. And he came near her, and the woman said, Are you Joab? He answered, I am. And then she said to him, Listen to the words of your servant. And he answered, I'm listening. And then she said, They used to say in former times, let them but ask for counsel at Abel, and so that settled the matter. I am one of those who are peaceful, or peaceable and faithful in Israel. You seek to destroy a city that is a mother in Israel. Why will you swallow up the inheritance of the Lord? And Joab answered, Far be it from me, far be it that I should swallow up or destroy. That is not true. But a man from the hill country of Ephraim called Sheba, the son of Bichri, has lifted up his hand against King David. Give up him alone, and I will withdraw from the city. And the woman said to Joab, Behold, his head shall be thrown to you over the wall. Then the woman went to all the people in her wisdom, and they cut off the head of Sheba, the son of Bichri, and threw it out to Joab. So Joab blew the trumpet, and they dispersed from the city every man to his home, and Joab returned to Jerusalem to the king. That's an odd and graphic little picture, isn't it? Kind of funny to my mind, but I want to be sensitive to sensitive viewers. Um, so Sheba's run away, he's gathered some supporters, and when it says he's gone through all the tribes of Israel, he ends up in this city of Abel, of Beth Maka, which is um, in the far north of the country. So he, he has kind of gone through the whole place. He's quite far from Jerusalem, trying to gather supporters, and it seemed that he only managed to convince kind of his own relatives to stand with him. And uh, they've, they've gone through and they've holed up in this city. And, uh, and this section presents Joab in sharp contrast to this wise woman, and there's many parallels to the other unnamed wise woman that we met in chapter 14. But in this incident, like, Joab is perhaps never more clearly portrayed 
as one for whom human lives hold very little value and for whom the ends justify the means. Okay, think about it. Joab has an army, he's chasing a dude that has a little ragtag band, and he goes into an Israelite city. He knows Sheba is in the walled city. We don't read of any diplomatic tactics or even like tactical attempts to, on Joab's part to go in and capture Sheba alone. What does he do? He comes to the city and he goes directly to siege works and battering ramps, right? There's a saying that's contributed to Confucius, never kill a mosquito with a cannon. Oh, Joab was all about that, right? He's like 500 years before Confucius, so he didn't have a chance to read the book. But he just, he just goes, right? Joab doesn't want to take any chances. He has the manpower to do it, and he doesn't care about collateral damage. So he just starts building siege ramps and literally beating down the walls of the city. You know, opposition to this is this woman who has a reputation for wisdom. She speaks with humility and addresses the terrible losses that Joab uh, seems eager to inflict on this city who is like a mother in Israel. Joab pauses and counters that, no, he's not out to destroy or devour. He's just trying to do what needs to be done, right? I need to capture or kill a treasonous rebel. The city just happens to be in the way. She's like, hold on, right? So then she speaks to the leaders of her city and her wise words and her, hum her, her humility. Uh, gain her a hearing there too, and they agree to give up um, Sheba in a brutal fashion that totally fits the tone of the chapter. And actually, it might be pointing an accusing finger at Joab, sort of like she's saying, "Yeah, we'll we'll get him, and we'll we'll cut off his head. I guess I'll throw it to you over the wall since you barricaded all the doors. Like the city's under siege, we can't leave, even though like we're Israelites and we're on your team. But you're you've gone to you know you've walled us right in. I guess we'll just punt it over the wall for you." Okay, and Joab's like, Roger that. However, you do what you got to do, um, and so they do it. Now, if the woman had been ignored by the people of Abel Beth Maka, if they decided to harbor the rebel, we're not going to let this Joab tell us what to do. If they had decided to keep him in there, keep him safe, they would have brought destruction on their whole city. But by recognizing the danger that they were exposed to by the presence of this one man, who probably looked innocent when he rolled in, um, they wisely rejected him and put him to death and cast him out. And again, there's a strong parallel here to our response to sin. When, and, and it cuts both ways, okay? First, as Christians, we are told we are brothers and sisters in Christ with each other. We're part of the body of Christ. Part of that is that we are to exhort and encourage and correct one another. So if you see sin in the life of a brother or sister, and you're like, man, like that's just not right, that's gonna wreck their life, it's not, and you're gonna confront that, listen, do not lay siege to the entire person, okay? Yes, we are to help and admonish one another because we all have blind spots, that's part of being the body of Christ, but we are to do so gently. Galatians 6 verse 1 says, Brothers, if anyone is caught in any transgression, you who are spiritual should restore him in a spirit of gentleness and keep watch on yourself lest you too be tempted. So don't be like Joab, right? You spot someone doing one little thing wrong and you reject them as a person or attack everything, right? Precision. You don't need to bulldoze the whole thing. On the other side, when we are confronted with the sin in our lives, I think if we're honest, we're often tempted to go on the defensive. Especially when the brother or sister pointing out our sin happens to have glaring shortcomings of their own to deal with. And who doesn't? Like, that's we all do. And, and, and when the sin they point out in my life seems small and not all that dangerous, there are a lot of things in us as humans that resist being corrected. But... Like the people of Abel Beth Macca, we are wise to recognize the danger to our lives that comes from harboring even a little sin. And while we might be correct about the ham-fisted efforts of our well-meaning brothers and sisters, maybe they do have their own faults, um, we ought to appreciate the heads up about the rebel in our midst and honestly kill it as quickly as we can and punt its head over the wall. Um, if only we were wise enough to do so. Last verse and then we're going to shift gears here quick. Um, last three verses, we see the kingdom restored. And this is a bit of an epilogue. It says, now Joab was in command of all the army of Israel. Benaiah, the son of Jehoiada, was in charge of the, the bodyguards, the Carathites and the Pelethites. 
Adoram was in charge of forced labor. Jehoshaphat, the son of Ahimud, was the recorder. Sheba was the secretary, and Zadok and Abiathar were priests. And Ira, the Jerite, was also David's priest. Um, historically, it's fun to chase down each of those names. I'm not going to do that today. But this passage, as I said, serves as an epilogue to the main narrative about David's kingdom. We're not done the series, but the events of the following chapters are not in chronological order. They're arranged thematically, but, but this is like the story pauses. It's going to pick up again in Kings where it talks about sort of chronologically the, uh, the passing of the torch. Um, but at this stage, we see that David's kingdom has been restored after the rebellions of Absalom and Amasa. And it's just because God has been incredibly gracious and faithful to David. Even though David's sin um, was a thing that brought it about. David was, or God was gracious to David even through his sin and through the consequences of it. And we see this description of David's court, right? It is full of imperfect people. Like, did anyone else notice? Just, yep. So Joab was in command of all the army of Israel. How did you get your job back? Like, is that official policy? If you get demoted, but you got the guy who took your job, you can have your job back? We don't, right? Joab was a powerful person. David needed him. David didn't agree with him. The whole list is broken people, right? But they are, they have moments of brilliance and faithfulness as well as selfishness and sin. And the people of God are always this way. It's God's kingdom established and protected and sustained by his power and grace. This is kind of the line that we stand in even today. Brought near not because we're better than these guys, but because of what Jesus, the son of David, did for us when he died on the cross. When he put our sin to death in his body, so that by his power we can live in victory, and we can live in victory over sin even now. 